Hi, my name is Tom Pye. I'm the costume designer for Gentleman Jack. I think the, the big question I needed to answer with Gentleman Jack was why was she called Gentleman Jack? Why did people from that time think she looked like a man? And I've got Saran Jones, who's beautiful and elegant and, and a really complicated character because she's like a chameleon. She sort of lived in so many different stratas of society she would be very happy working on her estate with her men and get her hands dirty. So at some level she was yeah, like a Vita for Central West character. And in others she was in high society moving with royalty. We had to show all those different sort of characters and facets to her, her wardrobe. There was so much work I did from the diaries and great clues from the diaries. So I knew that things like Marion's often mending and Lister's clothes and so we know that she wore a corset, we know she wore petticoats, we know she had a great coat, a Spencer, a Pelisse, gaiters, boots, all these things are mentioned in the diary. And so from that collection of things I had to then go, okay, how does a woman who wears a petticoat and a corset get mistaken for a man? That's really, really difficult. That was what I was playing with as I was researching and thinking and so that took me on to researching uh, queer women throughout history and what they had worn and um, the ladies of Clangothan. Uh, I went to see them and I saw the top hats and the black. She declares in her diary and it's depicted in the portraits that she always wore black. Um, now that's kind of a, that's a rule in TV that you don't do that. You try and avoid black as much as possible. He says wearing black because it can flatten. It's very difficult to see detail on black on camera. It can often just sort of appear like a hole. So we had to work really hard in getting different kinds of blacks so that you can get texture, so you could see the form on her. So it didn't just look like a hole walking around uh, the frame. So I used lots of different blacks and then fading them and using different materials like velvet. So she's got a velvet collar on uh, a wool coat. So it just gives it sort of break up and form and shape. Uh, if it's all the same, it can really not look very good. But I did also notice on the portraits, she's wearing brown actually. And then that made me think, oh, okay, well, if she wore brown, then she clearly wasn't that dogmatic about the black. So I decided to widen that slightly to be anything that was really a male palette. So I brought in sort of inky dark blues and browns and greys so that I could make her costumes a little bit more interesting, a little bit more detailed, really. Yeah, I really got inspired by the colour palette of Yorkshire. I think that sort of love of the, the colours up here and spending a lot of time in the landscape uh, and then was probably encouraged by David Hockney's fantastic paintings that I saw up here. And then when thinking about Shipton Hall, I really wanted to celebrate those colours and think about that as an earthy, grounded Yorkshire home and enjoy the contrast between that and, and Walker's more contemporary, modern for its time. It would have been Georgian and very uh, completely the opposite. It's a, pastels and quite chilly and cold and, and not that warm, earthy, natural colour field. I was down the road in Todmorden and I walked into a, an antique shop, or an antique prince I think it was, and I came across this uh, satirical cartoon and I think it was Hyde Park or it was about fashion of the 1830s and I went, oh my god, that's it, because it was sort of taking the mickey out of the fashion of the time. And all the women were sort of had huge hats, enormous sleeves, and their skirts were way up. You know, were those sleeves really that enormous? But until you have an original piece and you can see the pads that they wore underneath the, the sleeves to hold them up, you can go, oh God, they really were. And, 
and some of the sleeves when you lay them flat are huge, they're absolutely vast. And so I could take all that and catalogue it and, and then really work from those. And I thought, that's okay, that's how I tell the story that Saran Jones looks like a man because the women are so extreme. They're all so, almost like dolls. When I'm working on costumes, whoever I'm working with, the conversations are often very similar about this, we're storytelling, so this character wants to come across like this. It's not ever about just replicating uh, a certain look or costume, it's about conveying character. This character is really uptight, and so we want to make things all a bit tight and a very straight lines or this character is very outdoorsy so the fabrics we choose want to express that and it wants to so like Tib we want to get the idea that she's always you know got dog treats in her pockets and she's always out on the walks and so then those kind of things go into the the way that you cut and you uh, make those and the fabric choices and the breaking down you know maybe there's mud splashes all the her clothes so it's a collaboration every time um, and I work with a fantastic team of makers on Gentleman Jack. And yeah, I go in there with references and a sketch and some fabrics. And the conversations probably uh, start before I even buy the fabrics. I'll go in there and say, okay, I found this fabric in Italy or wherever. Do you think it would work? And you know, do you think we can tailor that to get this effect? You know, I think it's, it's really fortunate that the, the TV series was set around here because there are still these existing factories that make wools just like they always did uh, back in the 19th century. So there are great places in Leeds and round Halifax, uh, Denim Velvets and uh, Moon and Sun. They were great. I would be able to get Linda on the phone all the time and say, I need this, and she would send things over for us. So there's many places that we could just pop into and, and there's something great about using local factories that still exist, that would have existed in an Anne's time. And something that was really exciting that we did for season two was I came here and had a look at your books of fabrics and fabric samples. And that was exciting to think these are the actual fabrics that Anne and Anne would have been looking at and would have been available when they went clothes shopping they would have seen these actual fabrics. And so we reproduced one. Uh, there was, I think, a couple that I scanned. And then the dress that you see behind me, the Anne Walker wears to Paris, uh, is a reproduction of a, of a print that you have in your archive. Once the costume is fully made and then fitted, it then goes on to be broken down. And we, what we call breaking down is sort of aging process. So costumes often don't really look correct until they've been properly aged. We want the audience to think that these clothes have been worn by this character for many, many years. And particularly in the 19th century, people didn't throw things away. I mean, there's endless um, mentions in the diaries of Marion sitting at the breakfast table repairing Anne's pelisse or her stays or whatever had fallen apart. So we need to get that detail into, into the costumes. And that can be really quite a complex process. So I'm particularly thinking about Anne's great coat. Some of these dresses just have a very light spray and knock back and some washing. But something like Anne's great coat that she really lived in went through many, many processes. So it was, a, it was made in linen and then it was dyed and then we waxed it to give it a sort of waterproof look and then that was really worked into with paints and colours. Uh, so you got effects like sun bleaching. So the layers of it, if you lift up the flap, it's much darker underneath. Um, and we'll often do that so that an arm under the arm, it, the colour's richer and darker. So it's sort of more faded up here. And then sort of grating, you know, just rubbing back the fabric. So it, look, you get that sense of wear and tear. All sorts of things. You just really have to think about the character and the usage. Well, I think that's what's lovely about Gentleman Jack is we see the whole strata of society 
from the very poorest to aristocracy in the Queen of Denmark. A lot of key characters are, are, the, are the servants in Shibden Hall and they were lovely to do just for that great contrast but also to invent a, a livery set. What I did was take one of the colours from the coach, the sort of chartreuse mustard colour, and we based the livery on that, and then took the crest and put that onto the buttons. So that was really nice, and nice to have that uniform and then sort of mess it around, so that when we're seeing them sort of behind the scenes in Shibden Hall, sometimes they're just wearing a waistcoat and shirt and uh, looking quite scruffy. But it's a very different way of approaching costume for those people because it's about practically what they're doing. So the cook and the servants have to portray themselves in a certain way if they're answering the door. But if they're you know, pulling the guts out of a rabbit, they have to have practical clothes and aprons and layers. And it would have been really quite cold. So there's a lot of layers, particularly in different seasons. I think in season two, we went into winter quite, quite a bit. And so that's nice to portray as well not so nice for the actors. I knew that Anne needed status. That was something that we sort of worked out just in trying things on Saran Jones. And this idea of her silhouette in the street, if we saw a wide shot and saw Anne walking towards camera, away from camera, I knew she needed to have status and to look like a man. And so, yeah, the idea really came from the ladies of Langoslin and from George Sand, looking at queer women through history. And then when we had these dress-up sessions at Cosprop, we tried a top hat and it just instantly worked. It just suddenly went, oh yes, particularly with a long coat. When you put a top hat on, then you went, okay, yes, I can believe that that silhouette could be mistaken for a man but also it has such power. And, and it had something that we wanted to really do with Anne Liston, which was kind of make an icon, make somebody that you wanted to be and you could look up to, um, particularly for the, the gay community. It's great to have somebody who, yes, we all want to be a bit Anne occasionally. Mm -hmm.